The Koreans have a saying, when the whales fight, the shrimp get hurt. Why are there two Koreas? There really shouldn't be two Koreas. And this is a historical anomaly that we are living it with right now, with there being two Korean states. If we look at Korea, it's on the far eastern end uh, of the Eurasian landmass, uh, jutting out in the seas, separating China and Japan, with Mongolia and Russia to its north. Like a lot of the countries around there, it had gone through a period of warring states, but finally the Koryo dynasty unified the Korean peninsula around 900 AD. Koryo and the succeeding uh, Choson dynasty ruled Korea as an independent, unified polity for about a thousand years until uh, Japan colonized Korea in 1910. Korea's geographic position, but also political position, has put it uh, at a crossroads in Asia and what we would now call being caught in the middle of great power competition, particularly between China and Japan. Korea would continue to be caught in the middle as World War II came to an end. In the closing days of the war, the United States had isolated Japan and its Korean colony and was concentrating on how to invade their home islands. But several factors, including the dropping of two atomic bombs and the Soviet Union's attack into Manchuria, forced Japan to surrender, negating the need for an Allied invasion. Now the U.S. faced a new problem, how to stop the Soviet forces that were moving into Korea. The Americans proposed, and the Soviets agreed, to divide the country along the 38th parallel, an arbitrarily chosen line which cut the country roughly in half and halted the Russian advance. In September of 1945, U.S. occupation forces landed in the southern portion of the peninsula and began the process of returning the Korean peninsula back to the Koreans. Since the Allies had agreed in 1943, that Korea should be free and independent in due course, and this country seemed to have little strategic value, the Koreans were finally going to be left alone. But the road to independence was not as straightforward as it initially appeared, and would eventually lead to war. Why did North Korea attack South Korea? Korea is unique in the fact that it's at a crossroads where it has influence from China, has influence from the Soviet Union, but ultimately it has influence from in the South from the United States and Japan. So it's at this unique strategic crossroads as we move into 1948, 49, and 50. Against that backdrop, you have the larger global Cold War that's evolving, although the fixation is on Europe, so China goes red. Uh, you have the Soviet Union detonating their first atomic bomb in 1949 as well, which is a shock to the United States, which assumed they would get the bomb around 1955. You have to check the Soviets or, or communism everywhere. In this evolving Cold War environment, the U.S. and the Soviet Union could not agree on what a unified Korea should look like. So in 1948, the United States turned to the United Nations. Hopefully it could establish a central government. In August, Elections were held in the South, and the UN recognized the Republic of Korea, or ROC. President Sigmund Rhee became the head of this new government in Seoul, and he claimed control of the entire peninsula. But the Soviet Union refused to recognize the ROC government and formed their own. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea, under Kim Il-sung, also claimed control of the entire peninsula. Unable to create a single state that was free and independent, both the U.S. and the Soviet Union withdrew their troops in 1948 and 1949, leaving the two Korean governments to figure it out on their own. Predictably, tensions rose between these two new countries. As the two Koreas skirmished along their border, two very different armies faced each other. By the summer of 1950, the Soviets had provided the much larger North Korean army with tanks, heavy artillery, and attack aircraft. South Korea had none of these. With Sigmund Rhee constantly calling for unification by war, 
the U.S. refused to give Seoul any offensive weapons, leaving Rhee's army as essentially a light infantry force, best suited to deal with internal conflict. Conversely, Kim Il-sung was capable of reuniting the peninsula by force, and it appeared that the U.S. might not come to the aid of the South Koreans. In 1950, Dean Acheson, the U.S. Secretary of State, announced a Far East defensive perimeter, which omitted Korea and Formosa. Kim saw his opportunity. Looking for support from Joseph Stalin, Kim convinced him that even if the U.S. did come to the aid of South Korea, they would not be able to react quickly enough. Dawn, 25 June, 1950. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea attacked the Republic of Korea. Spearheaded by T-34 tanks, this invasion by 10 North Korean Army divisions was rapid. Harry S. Truman did not hesitate. The future of civilization depends on what we do, on what we do now and in the months ahead. We have the strength and we have the courage to overcome the danger that threatens our country. The U.S. government quickly agreed to counter North Korean aggression with ground troops. The leaders of the free world had to draw a line to stop the spread of communism, and it would be on the Korean Peninsula. How did the UN stop the communist invasion? Considering the deteriorating situation in, in Korea, uh, militarily and politically, this makes little sense if you look at it in a logical and uh, sound way. However, as this policy of containment is becoming the national security um, strategy of the United States, we have to go as a means to check the expansion of communism. As the United States deployed, it was able to gain the support of the United Nations which passed a resolution that denounced the invasion and eventually authorized troops to counter the North Korean aggression. The forces that moved to stop the North Koreans did so under a UN flag. 17 countries provided naval, air, and ground forces, but it was the U.S. that provided the overwhelming majority for the UN effort and made most of the decisions that shaped the war. Certainly, the victors of World War II would make short work of the small nation. Unfortunately, U.S. military effectiveness had significantly declined since the end of World War II. America's atomic monopoly enabled the Truman administration to enjoy bipartisan support for reducing defense expenditures from a high of $82 billion in 1945 to just $13 billion for fiscal year 1950. Now, this drawdown was not well managed, and the end result was chaotic. From a high strength of 8 million soldiers and officers in 90 divisions in 1945, the U.S. Army could field just 10 regular Army divisions for all of its global commitments in 1950. Moreover, all of these formations were woefully under strength due to budget constraints, and despite the valiant efforts of leaders at every echelon, they were unevenly trained and incompletely equipped. The most immediate troops available for deployment into the peninsula were the four occupation divisions of the U.S. Far East Command. These troops were led by General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur. On 10 July, MacArthur was named the commander of all U.N. forces in Korea. But the U.S. forces in Japan were not ready to face the North Korean onslaught. The 8th Army had to improvise to stop the communists. First, the 7th Division had to be cannibalized, which gave the other three divisions enough combat power to deploy. Then, the 24th Infantry was piecemealed to buy time and give the rest of the Army a chance to establish a lodgment. The initial U.S. contact with the North Koreans was 50 miles south of Seoul. A small element of 540 soldiers, known as Task Force Smith, was quickly overwhelmed. When larger units of the 24th Infantry Division were sent north, they experienced a similar fate. This series of defeats was a blow to UN morale and cost the 24th 30% of its force. But it allowed the 8th Army 
commanded by Lieutenant General Walton Walker, to build strength and establish a lodgment by 22 July. This became known as the Battle of the Pusan Perimeter. By the end of this battle, the 8th Army outnumbered and outgunned the North Koreans, who were at the end of a long and vulnerable supply line. These conditions allowed for General MacArthur's military brilliance to shine. Why did MacArthur attack at Incheon? With the 8th Army backed into the corner of the Pusan perimeter, MacArthur's options were limited. During World War II, General MacArthur had great success in the Pacific, executing amphibious operations that bypassed the enemy's strength and attacked into rear areas. MacArthur was adamant that his forces should again use this technique that had proven so successful in the islands of the Pacific. He chose the port of Incheon to conduct the amphibious operation. Landing at Incheon, however, would not be easy. Incheon posed several challenges to a successful amphibious landing. The single largest concern was the tides. Incheon experiences severe tidal variations, which exceed 25 feet and drastically limit the timing and location of any potential landing. Geographically, the harbor possessed a single narrow entrance channel, dominated by a fortified island, Womido, which would need to be reduced before any assault could begin. There was no beach. The harbor was instead lined with a rock seawall with few exits. Moreover, the city itself boasted a population of more than a quarter million. Once ashore, soldiers and Marines would find themselves fighting in a dense and irregular urban terrain that favored the defenders. And finally, just getting to Incheon from staging ports in Japan would prove problematic since the typhoon season began in early September. Because of these challenges, most of the top Army and Navy leadership were opposed to this location. Many would attempt to dissuade their commander, but MacArthur would not budge from his conviction that this operation would work. MacArthur stated that the very arguments you have made as to the impracticabilities involved will tend to ensure for me the element of surprise. For the enemy commander will reason that no one would be so brash as to make such an attempt. Surprise was to be the key to success. To accomplish this mission, MacArthur formed the 10th Corps, made up of the 1st Marine Division and the reconstituted 7th Infantry Division. Instead of including Walker and the 8th Army in the chain of command, the 10th Corps commander, Major General Edward Almond, would answer directly to MacArthur. Called Operation Chromite, 10th Corps began landing at Incheon on 15 September 1950. With little resistance or prepared defenses to oppose them, they moved rapidly inland to capture the South Korean capital, Seoul. The 1st Marine Division, commanded by Major General O.P. Smith, was pushed hard. General Almond wanted to capture Seoul by the three-month anniversary of the North Korean attack. Smith who had a rocky relationship with Almond, told him that he couldn't guarantee anything. That's up to the enemy. MacArthur also pushed for a rapid advance to the capital. With fighting still occurring in Seoul, the Supreme Commander conducted a very publicized ceremony at the Capitol building on 29 September. He announced that Sigmund Rhee was once again in control of South Korea. The North Korean army was in trouble. With 10th Corps threatening to cut them off, and a now superior 8th Army on the offensive, the North Korean Army began to withdraw and eventually disintegrated. Why did the UN attack into North Korea? 
The Incheon landing could be viewed as catastrophic success, as the landing enabled the UN forces to retake Seoul, to bring South Korea government back into power, uh, and to cut off the North Korean lines. But it also presented a dilemma. While there is deliberation going on in Washington and among the UN coalition forces about what to do next, the UN forces had the initiative. So now a decision had to be made. Do the UN forces go with their initiative and go north, or do they stop at the 38th parallel? Recognizing that moving north could reunify under the Republic of Korea government, but it could also trigger another world war by drawing in other world powers such as China and the Soviet Union into the war. One person not concerned with this dilemma was the commander of the UN forces. For MacArthur, annihilation of the severely wounded North Korean army should be the new goal. There could be no substitute for victory. The US Congress agreed. They pressured President Truman to shift from containment to unification, which, if successful, would satisfy the 1943 Allied Agreement of a free and independent Korea. It was also evident that President Rhee had every intention of continuing north. The Soviets seemed to be backing away from the war, and MacArthur made assurances that the Chinese would not intervene. Harry Truman, Dean Acheson, and George Marshall agreed to expand the war. The U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff gave MacArthur new orders. Your military objective is the destruction of the North Korean armed forces. You are authorized to conduct military operations north of the 38th parallel in Korea, provided that at the time of such operations, there has been no entry into North Korea by major Soviet or Chinese communist forces, no announcement of intended entry, nor a threat to counter our operations militarily in North Korea. Fortunately for this U.S.-led operation, the U.N. announced a resolution that called for a unified, independent, and democratic Korea, justifying the action on the world stage. On October 1, 1950, MacArthur called for North Korea to surrender as South Korean soldiers began crossing the parallel. The North Koreans remained silent, so U.S. troops also crossed on 9 October. The U.N. forces moved rapidly, and Pyongyang, the North Korean capital, fell on 19 October. But MacArthur threw a wrench in the works. Instead of attaching the 10th Corps to the 8th Army, as General Walker wanted, MacArthur kept control of this corps and sent them around the peninsula to conduct yet another unpopular amphibious landing. This time, the target was Wonsan. The intention was to cut off retreating North Koreans. General Matthew Ridgway would later state, no one was questioning the judgment of the man who just worked a military miracle. But in the time it took the 1st Marine and 7th Infantry Divisions to make the journey, the rest of the 8th Army had pursued the broken North Koreans overland and beat the 10th Corps to Wonsan. In the end, the two forces were divided by 30 to 80 kilometers of mountainous terrain. While this gap was covered by rock troops, they were no match for the large Chinese force that was about to enter the war. On 15 October, President Truman had met General MacArthur on Wake Island to discuss the war. When Truman asked about the possibility of a Chinese intervention, MacArthur answered in the negative. He was confident the Chinese would not become involved. And even if they did attempt to cross the Yalu River, UN air power would quickly stop them. The Chinese, however, had other ideas. Why did China enter the Korean War? In 1949, one year before the outbreak of the Korean War, the Chinese Communist Party under the leadership of Mao Zedong had emerged victorious from the Chinese Civil War and declared the foundation of the People's Republic of China. In the state, it was unclear if China was ready for another war, but as Mao saw Americans flowing up the Korean Peninsula, he decided that it will be China who will determine the course of events in East Asia. 
Infiltrating across the Yalu River in October, a Chinese force of 300,000 soldiers appeared, apparently out of nowhere, and then disappeared after 7 November. Determined to finish the war, MacArthur called for the advance of his forces towards the Chinese border, as well as the bombing of the Alu Bridges. Almond was ordered to push the 10th Corps rapidly west and link up with the 8th Army, but this last attempt to end the war met with disaster. The UN forces were piecemealed. This allowed the Chinese to strike at the UN's greatest weakness, the gap between the 8th Army and 10th Corps. After destroying the ROC's 2nd Corps, they turned on the separated U.S. forces. Rugged terrain and cold weather made the already difficult situation almost unbearable for the troops involved. Trying to preserve combat power, the Americans became desperate in their attempts to withdraw from the Chinese onslaught. One example of this was Task Force Faith, where an entire battalion was lost while attempting to escape. Those that did survive relied on firepower, air power, and sheer willpower. Eventually, 10th Corps was evacuated by sea, and General Walker was successful in withdrawing the 8th Army to the 38th parallel. But Walker lost his life in a tragic Jeep accident and was replaced by Lieutenant General Matthew Ridgway. Famous in World War II for leading the 82nd Airborne Division and the 18th Airborne Corps, Ridgway would infuse his fighting spirit, which the 8th Army desperately needed after their collapse and withdrawal back to South Korea. The 1st Marine Division G3 said that Ridgway brought a new fresh attitude, a new fresh breath of life to the whole 8th Army. How did the UN stop the communist invasion again? At this point in the war, Washington decided to abandon reunification. The U.S. returned to the original goal of retaining North and South Korea, with the border returning to the 38th parallel. This mattered little to the communists. They kept their goal of reunification and kept pushing south, capturing Seoul for a second time on 4 January 1951. It appeared that they might push the U.N. forces off the peninsula yet again. Unfortunately for their cause, while heavy in numbers, the communists were light on logistics and firepower and could not sustain this offensive. By the end of February, Ridgeway began a series of counterattacks. With names like Killer and Ripper, they were designed to return the UN forces to the 38th parallel and more importantly, heavily attrit the communists. General MacArthur, however, still felt annihilation should be the UN goal. Asia should be the main effort, the place to confront communism, not Europe, as the President and the Joint Chiefs believed. We're not going to ignore the danger of aggression elsewhere. There is actual warfare in the Far East, but Europe and the rest of the world are also in very great danger. The same menace, the menace of communist aggression, threatens Europe as well as Asia. MacArthur had blatantly contradicted the president on this and many other points, both verbally and in writing, throughout the war. After making one too many insubordinate statements, Truman finally relieved MacArthur on 11 April 1951 and replaced him with Ridgway. Lieutenant General James Van Fleet took the reins of the 8th Army and continued Ridgway's strategy of attrition. The goal was to make the war so painful and costly in human lives, the communists would eventually negotiate a peace. The war continued with only limited objectives for two more bloody years. While the war never technically ended, an armistice was signed on 27 July 1953. A demilitarized zone was established between the two Koreas, and an uneasy peace has been observed by both countries ever since. <laughs>